fighting for what they believe in. Dominicans protest in Philadelphia. A look into the future. Engineering students get a new facility. Philadelphia gets a taste of Carnival. Hello and welcome. You're watching Temple Update. I'm Aliyah Mayo. And I'm Kenny Cooper. The Temple community is still in shock after a student was killed in a hit and run just blocks away from main campus. The incident happened at the corner of 8th Street and Cecil B. Moore Avenue, where police say a driver was speeding in the wrong direction. Temple Update's Connell Smith is live at the scene with more details. Connell, what do you have for us? Well, thank you, Kenny. The university ID'd the victim as 27-year-old Ajay Agnarati. He was a fourth-year student in the College of Liberal Arts, majoring in political science and economics. He was in the crosswalk that you see behind me, possibly on his way home, when the reckless driver, as you said, was going the wrong way and speeding and fatally hit him. Surveillance footage shows Agna Hatri taking his last steps, crossing the street before the speeding gray Hyundai slams into him. Police say that Agna Hatri was propelled more than 150 feet from impact. The driver then continued further for another two blocks, where they dumped the heavily damaged car on 8th and Burke Street. Debris from the accident and the victim's shoe could be seen littering the street. Philadelphia police say they do not know who was driving the vehicle the night of the accident, but they know who owns it. We are looking for a driver. Uh, we have a vehicle in custody. We know that it is the vehicle. Eventually, we will get the driver. Uh, I would encourage the driver to examine their conscience and do the right thing. Now, as stated, they do know who owns the vehicle, but it's unclear whether or not the owner of the vehicle was the one driving the night of the accident. Authorities went to the owner's house in northeast Philadelphia to find that no one was home. If you have anyone has information regarding the accident, they're urged to call Philadelphia police. For now, Connell Smith, Temple Update. Three students have contracted the mumps. Last spring, over 180 students were infected. For an update, Victoria Lucas is live in the newsroom. Victoria, do we have to worry? Aliyah, good morning. Temple Health officials say we do not have to worry. They also told me the three students who had the mumps are doing well. Uh, and we're still only at three, um, and we're hoping that's where it stays. Mm -hmm. uh, Senior Director of Health Services Mr. Mark Denai says about 7,000 students, staff, and faculty members received the mumps vaccine last year in efforts to prevent possible contraction. Denai told me two of those three students who have recently contracted the mumps did in fact receive the vaccine, but the vaccine is not 100% effective. The vaccine's not perfect. Uh, it's only 88% effective. It can be low as you know, in the 60s. So there are some folks that don't get the protection from the vaccine uh, that others do. The University Health Department added the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, or MMR, as required immunization for incoming students this past fall. Current students must have the vaccine by March 1st. Denai says the new requirement will help determine who has the vaccine and what necessary steps to take next. But it's really about trying to increase that awareness, uh, collect the information so that we have a good database of who's been vaccinated against what disease that, they, uh, that they've been vaccinated against. Denai says the mumps should not be a concern for anyone. However, the concern today is the flu. Between October and now, we typically see over 3,000 students with influenza-like illness. Um, and that's every year we see that many. Uh, this year, it's a little bit more than last year. Uh, but not quite as many as it was two years ago. Nye says to prevent the flu, you should use the same precautions you would to prevent a cold and to continue to use these health routines over spring break. University Health Services will notify the university if the mumps is a concern. For now, it is not. We're live in the newsroom. I'm Victoria Lucas. Aliyah, back to you. All eyes were on the Democratic presidential debate stage on Tuesday night as candidates tried to make their case to South Carolina voters ahead of Saturday's primary. And Current Democratic frontrunner Senator Bernie Sanders received a barrage of attacks in the debate and on Wednesday, South Carolina Congressman and Democratic House Majority Whip Jim Clyburn endorsed Joe Biden. This is an important endorsement because of the influence that Clyburn has in the state. California, Texas, and 12 other states will make their voices heard in the biggest presidential primary day to date, Super Tuesday. 
The 63 delegates at stake in South Carolina pale in comparison to the 1,357 delegates that will be up for grabs on March 3rd. Candidates vying for the opportunity to take on Trump in the general election will be dead set on trying to gain some steam ahead of the Democratic convention. So Friday marks the last day of classes for anyone who did not know, but before spring break, students are preparing for their mid-semester rest. It officially begins on Monday and continues until Sunday of next week. This is the last break of the 2019-2020 academic school year and comes earlier than most other universities in the region. Temple students come from near and far, and we were curious just how far they may be traveling next week. Le Temple Update's Liana Goldman smoke, spoke with students, I'm sorry, to find out, and she's live now to tell us more. Liana? Aliyah Kenny, the students I spoke to are just counting down the minutes until break. A few of them have plans across the nation, while others are okay with staying right here. Take a listen to what these owls are up to. Uh, you know, just probably going home, might head down to the beach. Ride some waves, you know. I got this kind of like a political job around here. I'm not exactly sure what it fully entails yet, but I have an interview on Friday for it. From this spring break, I don't really have any plans. I'm thinking about like catching up with assignments because there's going to be a bunch and studying for midterms. How nerdy, right? <laughs> My parents are trying to go to like different places around the United States. Like we, we haven't decided. Maybe New York, maybe California. Full on relax mode is so close. Good luck on those exams. If you're traveling next week, pack appropriately. I think I see some sunshine in your future, but Matt Silverman will have your full forecast coming up. Reporting live on Polette Walk for Temple Update, I'm Liana Golden. Guys? Thank you, Liana. Tuesday, we brought you live coverage from the New Hampshire primary. Bernie Sanders won the Democratic primary with a little more than 76,000 votes. President Trump won the Republican primary with 85% of the vote. Kenny was there with our reporter, Connell Smith. Kenny and Connell, you two were on the ground in New Hampshire. What can you tell us? Well, Aaliyah, from the boom in business to the hordes of journalists, Grand State voters could feel the full effect of the first in the nation primary. <clears throat> While New Hampshire can be an opportunity for candidates to spread their wings, it can also be the end of the road for those trailing in the polls. Speaking to voters before they cast their ballots, Temple Update wanted to know what Granite Staters are looking for in a presidential candidate. I'm going to quote Amy Klobuchar, but then I'll get back to Joe. We're we have a newcomer in the White House, and look where that got us. Voters in New Hampshire may not know exactly who they're voting for, but the general consensus is to find a candidate to unseat the president. Elizabeth Warren brought me here, and also the uh, state of our country, and Trump brought me here to fight against him. Even some Republicans want to see a change in the White House. Yeah, because I'm a uh, registered Republican, and I'm very uh, outraged at everything that uh, Trump's done. I think he's an absolute, I think he's, he's got the intellect of a third grader. But not everyone that descends upon New Hampshire is there to vote. Many consider themselves political tourists, there to feel the excitement of the first in the nation primary. We, um, we decided we wanted to come up to uh, basically be political tourists, um, to sort of just really see what it was like up here. There's so much excitement and, and, and really try to figure out partly who to vote for. I happened to be close by visiting family in Connecticut, so I thought, why not help out, see what we can do. While New Hampshire does not have as many delegates as other states, candidates use the smaller political arena to dig deeper for a more intimate style of politics. As part of our primary coverage, I followed the campaigns across the state as they tried to connect with voters outside of the large political venues that they're known for. I'm running for the presidency because I believe the presidency has a purpose. That's why I'm asking for your support. Candidates from both parties largely ditched the giant stadiums for small gymnasiums as they courted voters by reminding them of their electoral importance and their influence. You don't realize this, but you are among the most powerful and influential people in our country today. So what happens here in New Hampshire is enormously important. With the specter of the president looming large over the Democratic field, talk of a life-altering choice was all the rage. I've lost a lot in my lifetime, as you have. Mm -hmm. I lost a lot. But I tell you, I'll be damned if I'm going to stand by and lose this country to Donald Trump. This is all about to choose hope over fear. We choose science over fiction. Unity over division. Small interactions.
actions that candidates are making can make a big impression on voters. Thank you, Kenny and Connell. The Nevada caucus will be held on February 22nd. Be sure to stick with Temple Update for the continued election coverage. Coming up on Temple Update. They shoot, they score. Temple men's basketball continues their two-game hot streak. Find out who they will be playing this Sunday when we come back. And a Temple alumna stops by the Today Show to talk about her dream of competing in the Olympics. Our Victoria Lucas is outside right now in Conwell Hall to give us more information about the coronavirus. Victoria? Yes, Aaliyah, so earlier this week I did speak to Temple students and how the coronavirus has affected them and their families. So here's, here's what they had to say. It took me like uh, three weeks, so I realized this like will happen. So I feel like very horrible and sad. Temple student Ophelia Lee says she was in disbelief when she first heard of the coronavirus. She tells us she worries for her family. They will wear a face mask every day if they go out. And uh, like for now, they just stay at home 24 hours. Like they didn't go out. Xing Yi Lee says she wants to visit her family this summer, but she has some concerns. I also worry about the travel ban. Like, because I read a lot of news about the travel ban uh, in Australia and in the U.S., so I'm afraid if I go back to China, I cannot go back to U.S. to study. Here at the Office of International Affairs, the first action was to try to keep students safe. Now the administration is working to reduce any potential threat to students. We want to make sure that, uh, particularly students from China, that university right, supports them not just uh, uh, about uh, the health care, but also uh, as a community that uh, we want to tell them that we uh, understand what they are going through. Vice President of International Affairs Dr. Hai Lung Dai says his office is ready to provide students with counseling if they need it. Ophelia hopes people across campus and the country understand this one message. Uh, the enemy we all face the, is a virus, not Chinese. Yeah. And Dr. Dai says if any students were to face any discriminatory behavior to alert the office so they can address it accordingly and also address the general public with the right information. Reporting live outside of Conwell Hall for Temple Update, I'm Victoria Lucas. Back to you all in the studio. Thanks, Victoria. Jared Cruz is over at the sports desk to tell us more. Jared, what's going on in sports? What's up, Al fans? I'm Jared Cruz, and welcome to the sports desk. There has been a lot going on in the Temple sports world over the past couple of days, so let's get you updated. For all you Temple football fans out there, the wait is finally over. Temple football and the Philadelphia Eagles have reached an agreement on making the Lincoln Financial Field Temple's home for the next five years with an additional five-year option. The agreement is effective immediately and will run through the 2024 football season as the Owls have played since the, at the link since 2003 when the field opened. Philadelphia Eagles president Don Smolinski issued a statement saying, we are pleased to extend our agreement with Temple University, end quote. He goes on to say that they have enjoyed their relationship with Temple thus far and look forward to continuing this tradition with Temple University. Temple University president Rachel Engler issued a statement on his own saying that he is thrilled to have reached an agreement with the Eagles and looks forward to more home games. Women's lacrosse took on Rutgers Wednesday night at Hover Field. Temple fell behind early as Rutgers scored their first four goals of the game. But the Owls were able to regain momentum in the second half as Jen Roswich and Bella Maestro Petro each scored two goals. Maestro Petro also added five draw controls and four ground balls in an effort to come back. Unfortunately, this wasn't enough for the Owls as they suffered their first loss of the season, 13 to 11. Temple will continue to play at home, hosting the Princeton Tigers on Saturday, February 15th. All right, now let's take a trip down Broad Street to the Leah Corps Center, where the Owls face the SMU Mustangs. The Owls were 11-11 heading into this game and did not disappoint. Watch as senior guard Quentin Rose sinks the sweet middle-range jumper as they get the Owls going. As also lead the team with 25 points and 8 rebounds as the Owls shot from 17 for 25 from the field. In the end, the Owls were able to solidify a W in overtime, advancing to 12-11 on the season. And that's not the only thing that good thing that happened this past Saturday. Senior guard Quentin Rose made history as he became the American Athletic Conference all-time leading scorer. 
Rose broke the scoring record from achieving 1,718 points, surpassing the previous record held by Houston's Rob Gray. Over the duration of Rose's career, he never averaged less than 10 points and four rebounds each season. Temple will be gearing up to take on nationally ranked Villanova Wildcats on Sunday. If, the te if Temple wins, they'll get a share of the Big Five title with Villanova. If the Wildcats win, they'll sweep the Big Five this year. Villanova is coming off a big win last night, defeating ranked Marquette. The game will start at 1 p.m. and air on ESPN. The highly anticipated matchup has already been sold out. 500 student tickets will be available at, women's, at the women's basketball game versus Houston this Saturday. The remaining tickets will be sold at the front door to first come, first served. That's all for this edition of the Sports Desk. To stay up to date, be sure to follow us on Twitter at TU underscore Sports Desk. But for now, let's send it back to the desk. Aliyah and Kenny, back to you.